Now again, today's webinar is Availability and Quality Assessment of Genome-Wide Genetic Data on 9,900 Participants in the CLSA. Um, very briefly, let me introduce our speaker, Dr. Vince Forgetta. Dr. Forgetta is a research associate in the lab of Dr. Brent Richards, who is at the Department of Medicine, Human Genetics, Epidemiology, and Biostatistics at McGill. Trained in genomics and bioinformatics, his research interests include the management and analysis of large-scale hu human genetic data sets, the training of students, and leading research projects that investigate the role of genetics in human disease. Dr. Forgetta is also the system administrator of a local compute cluster at the Lady Davis Institute that services the research programs of three professors and their students and staff. So we'd like to, to thank Vince for being here, and I'll go ahead and turn over control of the webinar to him and invite him to begin. Thank you, Carol, for that nice intro. Um, and thank you to the CLSA for inviting me to give this talk. Um, and thanks to everyone for your interest in, uh, in this first genetic data release for CLSA. Um, I apologize on behalf of Dr. Richards. Uh, he wasn't able to make it last minute um, to um, to give this talk with me. Um, however, if there are if there happen to be any questions I am unable to answer during the question period, um, he has also invited you to uh, um, to send him any questions via email if that's permitted. Um, so the title of this brief talk will be the availability and quality assessment of genome-wide genetic data on 9,900 participants in the CLSA. I tried to make this talk as accessible as possible, so um, ended up uh, not covering um, so many, many of the technical details um, th um, that are in this genetic data release. However, uh, for the genomics people in the audience, if there are, um, please feel free um, to ask me as many detailed questions as you want during the question period. So this work is, uh, is the work of, uh, of quite a number of people, um, as you see on this slide here. Um, I would just uh, um, specifically like to acknowledge the work of the Montreal Genome Center, um, specifically Ruri Lee, Alexandra, Corinne, um, Janice, and Mark Lathrop, uh, who basically performed all the genotyping, so the acquisition of the raw data. And I would like to also acknowledge um, um, so Parminder, Suzanne, and Christina um, for leading um, on the CLSA. I'll just give a brief overview of what I'll be, I'll be talking about. Um, first, I'll just go over briefly a rationale for basically why we would like, we, why we would like to look at um, so human genetics in CLSA, then give a, a, a brief overview of the human genome and whole genome genotyping, followed by um, so genotyping of the CLSA, then followed by the imputation of the, genotype, uh, of the genotyping data, um, and some example um, um, so analyses we can do, such as genome-wide association studies and genomic prediction, followed by a brief conclusion. So here's the best example of I can think of of, of basically why we want to look at the human genome. Um, the main reason why is that basically uh, there are many traits. Um, uh, um, so there are many traits and diseases for which there is a large genetic component. And here I'll just show you a little story of basically the progress of human genetics in identifying regions in the genome associated to human disease and traits. So back in 2006, when we were first starting doing these whole genome scans, and by whole genome you see on this picture, which are the vertical lines, which are the chromosomes, in 2006 we found basically a handful of, um, of loci associated to human diseases or traits. Um, if we skip a few years in, into the future, into 2010, uh, our, um, as a field, um, the number of discoveries basically ballooned to roughly 5,000 associations um, across, you know, roughly almost 1,000 um, different traits and has led to, you know, um, so many, many research publications. If we fast forward to the end of last year, there are now 69,000 associations uh, to, to various human traits and diseases, and these things have... Uh, have basically um, directly contributed to our understanding of human biology, as well as to the as well as to the development of drugs and and new treatments. The CLSA offers an excellent opportunity to study um, so human genetics of disease um, 
for two main reasons, both because it is a very large cohort, one of, uh, of the largest cohorts in the world, um, and secondly, um, the comprehensive assessment uh, of many, many different traits and phenotypes and questionnaire data as well. Um, and I'll have a more specific example uh, of why CLSA is, uh, is actually very ideal um, for this type of work. Uh, I'll present towards the end of the talk um, so one of the projects I've been working on. So a brief description of genome genotyping of CLSA. First, I'll give a brief overview of, uh, of the human genome and human genetic variation. Um, as some of you may already know, the human genome is, dip is uh, um, the human genome is diploid, so we inherit one chromosome per biological parent. There are 22 pairs of chromosomes uh, of, of autosomes and two sex chromosomes. The human genome consists of three billion nucleotides, so A, C, Gs, and Ts. Um, and encodes roughly 20,000 protein coding genes. Um, the human genome can vary between individual, um, and there are multiple different types of variation. So things we call SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms are basically a change from one letter to another one, which you can see in the example below. Um, and there are, you know, other large, other larger changes such as insertions and deletions, and C and Vs or copy number variants. Um, Currently, uh, uh, the largest database holding this variation has cataloged over 100 million SNPs. Um, and so in the example below, we can see, you know, there are three individuals. For example, I would, you know, carry potentially um, on one of my parental chromosomes a C, and at that same position, I might carry a T, versus if you look at Rui, she, you know, she inherited a C from both of her parents, and Brent inherited a T from each of his parents. So how do we assess this variation um, across, uh, across one or more individuals? The idea is, uh, is basically if we take the example from the previous slide and we would like to assay that particular position in the genome um, um, you know, in three other people, let's say Alex, Corinne, and Janice, uh, we, we would take a DNA sample from them. We would develop some sort of an assay that basically measures that position in the genome and measures whether it's a C or a T, and then run this assay on, that, on those three DNA samples and basically obtain their genotypes. So the genotypes are basically just the pairs of the alleles of the SNP. So in this case, the alleles are either a C or a T, and the genotypes are the readout per person. So for example, Alex has a C and a T, um, and Corinne has a C and a C. And these assays can be multiplexed uh, on arrays um, containing anywhere from 500,000 to over a million SNPs. And this is exactly what we did for CLSA, is we used one of, the array, one of these arrays. Specifically, we used the Affymetrix UK Biobank Axiom Array that was uh, used um, to genotype one of the largest cohorts in the world, um, the UK Biobank. Um, it contains roughly 820,000 SNPs on the array. Um, the, the SNPs on this array target um, known loci associated with disease, target um, SNPs that are in genes, and more importantly, targle, uh, they target a panel of variants that are optimal for mutation, um, which I will get uh, into the next, um, uh, which I will explain later on in the talk. In this phase of, um, of genotyping, up to date, we have genotyped 9,900 individuals. Um, the individuals were genotyped in two batches of roughly 5,000 individuals each. And um, the list of, uh, of final variants that are produced from genotyping uh, is listed there, 794,409 SNPs per individual. I'll briefly go over um, how we assess the quality of, uh, of these 794,000 SNPs. We basically ran four tests. So we, the first test is um, right. So uh, in in the top left graph, I'll just explain the top left graph briefly, very quickly. Um, we see on the x and y axis um, the allele frequency per batch. So basically, the occurrence of 
of one of the genotypes per person, right, uh, over the entire population. So this graph contains roughly, uh, uh, sorry, um, so this graph contains exactly 794,409 SNPs, and we can see that uh, we would expect um, the allele frequency to not vary between batch, but what we observe is that there is some SNPs that vary and that are off the diagonal. And the goal here um, for the quality assessment is to try to remove as many of those SNPs that are off the diagonal. And we ran four tests to assess, um, to assess the quality of the SNPs. Um, the first test was just uh, um, to look for basically a, a batch level effect um, in the allele frequency between the two batches. And you can see that all the orange SNPs in the middle top graph are basically targeting the majority of the SNPs that are off the diagonal. And so these are considered um, of potential poorer quality. Um, the next test was looking for Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, um, which I'm happy to explain at the end of the talk if anybody's interested in knowing what exactly Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is. The third test was, um, so similar to the first test, was to just look for discordance in the allele frequency. Uh, but in this case, it's four control samples that we have um, I'm so inserted on all of the plates that were genotyped in CLSA. And the last test is to assess for discordance in genotype frequency between the sexes, but on the autosomes, as we don't expect um, the frequency of the SNPs to vary between the sexes on the non-sex chromosomes. When we apply all of these tests and filter out all the SNPs um, that basically exceed our thresholds, we end up with um, the picture in the bottom right, which you can see now, all the SNPs are highly concordant between the batches. Um, and these are the SNPs that we recommend that people use for their analysis. Um, all the SNPs along the diagonal total 781,000 SNPs, or 98.4% of all the SNPs. So while it looks like from the picture a lot of SNPs are excluded, uh, a very, very, very small amount were of low quality. The data is uh, actually of exceptionally high quality. Switching gears a little bit, now instead of looking at a per SNP quality assessment, we can look at a per sample quality assessment. So here, um, for example, on the graph below, I'll explain it shortly, there are 9,900 points, one for each individual. And the two metrics we looked at, which are on the axis, is, is the missingness rate. So per person, how many genotypes are, are we missing for that person? And uh, on the y-axis is the heterozygosity. So basically, how many... Um, how, many SNPs per, how many SNPs per person are heterozygous, basically meaning um, their genotypes are, are not the same on both of the chromosomes. For example, in my case that I had given a while ago, I was a C and a T, so I would be heterozygous. And it's just a counting of how many of the 800,000 um, are heterozygous, and that's also a measure of the quality, because we don't expect to have, for example, very, very high heterozygosity indicates that there's an issue um, comes with the genotyping or the DNA sample for that person. So if you look at the plot below, on the x-axis is the missingness, um, on the y-axis is the heterozygosity, and what we simply did was uh, we drew lines to define thresholds, and any points that lie beyond these thresholds are considered outliers, and we flag those as potentially being problematic. Also what's interesting and what's as expected, um, the heterozygosity does vary uh, I'm so among um, the self-reported ancestry within CLSA, which you can see uh, via the color coding of the points. I'll, be, I'll, briefly, I'll briefly present some other population level analysis um, that we've run specifically with the intention to generate information that, um, that people can use in their downstream analysis. So the first analysis that we did was uh, for familial relatedness. Um, so these are measures that are, are not recorded uh, so by CLSA at assessment, but we can measure them using the genetic data. And um, this information is useful for, uh, for many analyses, um, either by, uh, because they may introduce bias or you may actually want to analyze related individuals. Here we use the software program called King to assess familial relatedness and we obtained uh, the observed pairs of related people that you see on the right there. The next analysis was to assess the population structure. 
Um, the intention here is to complement the self-reported ancestry that's within CLSA and also to provide a metric by which uh, you can adjust um, so downstream analysis. For example, um, so genome-wide association studies, which I will present uh, in a few slides, um, um, so use the results from this analysis to remove bias caused um, by differences in population between, uh, um, so between the individuals in CLSA. Um, so briefly, you can see uh, on the plot below on the X and Y axis, there's a, um, they're labeled PC1, PC2. These are principal components. They're basically uh, measures, they're overall measures of the variation present across the genotype data across, uh, across all the individuals. PC1 and PC2 basically account for the most variation. When we plot PC1 versus PC2, and we overlay on top of this the self-reported ancestry, we can see that this variation associates very well with self-reported ancestry, which is, again, as expected. The next, uh, the next analysis we did um, was to determine the largest ancestral, ancestrally homogeneous subpopulation. Again, similar to principal component analysis uh, on the previous slide, um, this enables us to, to, uh, to focus the analysis on a subpopulation of CLSA that has a very similar genetic background, thus removing uh, potentially some of the bias associated uh, with attempting to analyze people of mixed ancestry, for example. And so here we can just see the orange point on the uh, graph on the left um, is basically um, the cluster that we've analyzed, that's the ancestrally homogeneous population. And on the right is just a measure of basically the variation left in that population in comparison to the entire cohort in gray. And you can see that the line is basically very low, which means that there is very little residual variation left in their genetic data um, that could potentially bias downstream analysis. Switching gears a little bit, I'll, I'll talk about the imputation of CLSA. So the purpose of imputation, so if you recall, there are roughly 800,000 variants available um, so per individual in CLSA. The goal of imputation is to basically get more genetic variants, so to increase that number from roughly 800,000 to, to potentially millions of genetic variants. Um, and how we do this is is we basically use a reference panel, uh, a, a, a completely independent set of individuals that are genotyped for many, many millions of variants. And the idea here is that, um, that with these many millions of variants, we'll increase the power of any studies that we do with these genetic tests and also enables um, so fine mapping. So basically to look for putatively uh, so causal variants or SNPs that actually cause the disease and not ones that are merely associated with it. Below is a cartoon of, of how the imputation process works. So for example, if we have genotype data from Rui and Corinne for three of 12 SNPs, and we have a reference panel of individuals uh, that contains all 12 SNPs, uh, basically it's just a comparing and filling game. So we compare Rui's genotype data to the reference panel and find one that matches or partially matches and then fill in Rui's genotypes using the reference panel. And we do the same thing for Corinne. This is clearly a very toy example. Um, the algorithm is actually um, sufficiently more complex than this, but the idea is basically a, a compare and fill operation. CLSA was imputed using the haplotype reference consortium panel containing 32,000 individuals and 40.4 million SNPs. We imputed the CLSA um, using an online service called the Sanger Imputation Service, basically resulting in um, the observed number that we have in the reference panel. So now we have 40.4 million genetic variants for 9.9 thousand participants. Um, in the plot below, we simply compare the quality that we obtain from the imputation in CLSA to a cohort of similar size, in this case, UK Biobank, um, 
And you'll note that you know if we look at UK Biobank, the, uh, so on the sorry on the x-axis is the minor allele frequency of the SNP, so how common that variant is in the population, and on the y-axis is simply a measure of the quality of the imputation, and we can see that. Um, while UK Biobank and its full data set overall has a higher quality, meaning that the line is higher, um, if we take a comparable random subset from UK Biobank of 9.9 thousand, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, of 9,900 individuals, we get a nearly equal quality. Um, and this is simply because um, the imputation improves when you um, give the algorithm more individuals. Uh, again, that's it's a, a very technical detail. I'm happy to explain why that is the case uh, during the question period. Now I'll show you how we can use the imputed data um, to, to run a genome-wide association study and what that looks like. So briefly, what is a genome-wide association study? It is simply we take each SNP and we just associate the genotype of the SNP across all the individuals to a trait in question. If the trait is a binary trait, such as uh, you have a disease or do not have a disease, um, it's, it simply returns to you um, the increase in odds of disease per allele of the SNP versus the control group, which you can see below. Um, for continuous traits, which is the graph on the right, um, it is simply um, a linear regression. So plotting a line through the points where on the x-axis, you can see here, we we basically just take each individual and plot them either on the left, middle, or right column according to the genotype for that SNP. And on the y-axis here, I have a toy example using their height. For, uh, as an, uh, so the height here is actually simulated. It's not real CLSA height. Um, and you can see that you know, people who have the TT allele are generally slightly shorter, and the people who have the CC allele are generally higher. And so we just plot a line through this. and and this is what we are trying to find when we're running a GWAS, um, is a signal like this, basically a, a, a non-horizontal line. When we run um, the association study for height in CLSA, we obtain the results that seen in this slide. On the x-axis here are 7.4 million SNPs um, ordered by their position on the genome. On the y-axis is simply a measure of, um, of the strength of association of each of those SNPs. So the higher the lines go on the y-axis, the, um, the, the more strongly we believe those SNPs to be associated with height. And here we see basically three signals at three genes, um, and these genes have um, and these genes have previously been identified to be associated with height. Um, so it, it, it's an excellent positive control showing that A, um, the genotyping worked excellent and um, that the imputation also worked well. Next, I'll show you another example um, using a very recent project that's ongoing in our lab um, is the genomic prediction of osteoporotic fracture. So being able to predict whether somebody is going to fracture their bones using their genotype data alone. So we have developed a model to predict bone density using genetic data, um, which you can see uh, on BioArchive, our recent paper. Um, this model was developed in UK Biobank, and we show that it can predict fracture risk. Um, and the idea for using CLSA in this study is, is to be able to validate the results in an external cohort that has been assessed in a similar manner to UK Biobank. So on the graph on the left, we have the, um, for the, uh, for the 9,900 individuals in CLSA, we have predicted their bone density in a similar manner that we have predicted in UK Biobank. And then what we would like to do in CLSA is to basically assess whether when we apply um, this genetic predictor on individuals, um, and compare that to their assessment for fracture risk without that predictor to show that basically when we apply the predictor, um, the number of expensive bone density tests that somebody would, would potentially have um, would be fewer because we can potentially screen people 
who have very high bone density, who have, who have genetically predicted very high bone density, and say that they're safe and they do not need to be tested, um, and therefore incur fewer tests for people that are very, very likely to not fracture their bone, but still capture the people that are, are, are at risk, basically. And the reason why CLSA is very useful for a study like this is A, because it is a very large sample size in a very relevant population. Um, it is assessed for all fracture risk factors, including questionnaire data that CLSA has performed um, and other measures. And also more importantly as well is that um, they've measured bone density across the vast majority of individuals so we can compare our predictor to a gold standard within CLSA. I'll briefly go over how the data is um, formatted for release. So the data is made available using established genotype file formats. These file formats are in binary format, so they're not in text format, um, um, both to reduce the size of the download and also offers rapid indexing of the data so you can search for it using software, so you can search for SNPs or, or particular individuals using software tools. The directly genotyped data, if you recall the 800,000 um, SNPs, is roughly a two gigabyte download in Plink format. Um, the imputed data is uh, sufficiently larger. It's a 36 gigabyte download in BGen format. Again, I'm happy to explain all the technical aspects of this at the end if anybody has questions. Um, and the data can be, uh, can be manipulated, analyzed. You can run GWASs in it, filter, um, and so forth using software programs such as Plink and BGenix. Just to conclude, again, the current release contains 9,900 individuals, roughly 800,000 genetic variants, 40.4 million imputed genotype data. Um, all of the summary statistics I've showed you, including the quality assessment, the familial relatedness, um, has been provided um, in supplementary files. Um, and moreover, what um, I did not demonstrate here is an additional data set where we have the imputation for the HLA, HLA alleles. In a future release, which uh, I expect to occur mid this year or, or, or later, um, is to have an additional 10,000 individuals released to uh, a total of roughly 20,000. And so thank you. I'm happy to take any questions at the time. Well, thank you. Um, that was a really great overview. and. Uh, I'm sure that people have many questions on some of your slides. Um, so please, we're going to open up this for a question and answer session now. So if you have any questions, please type it into the chat box menu. And we'll go ahead and um, discuss it with Dr. Fajetta. Um While we wait for people to uh, type in some questions and ask you about the presentation, I'll go ahead and uh, Start the conversation. So, sure. Sure. how did how did the selection happen for the individuals who were genotyped? How was that a, just a completely random selection, or was there some some process I, that went into that? If I recall, that? I think it was completely random. <clears throat> and do you have any details on how that was done? I do not. Yeah. Okay. I'm I'm, I'm a, I was a little bit further down um, the chain. Um, mm -hmm. I just received the genotype data, but I, I was on calls uh, about the selection, and from what I recall, I think it was random. So they attempted to make it make it random. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And while while you were you were talking about it, did, was there any um, any tests that were done for any rare variants that would actually lead to known diseases? I'm thinking about kind of the ethics and the consent issues with reportable diseases, or I'm sure there was a, a large amount of thought process and information gathering that went into kind of the consent process for for being able to do genotyping and yeah, uh, data not, and reporting the, of... The only analysis that we've done, um, which is in the QC document, uh, um, that's released along with the imputed data and the genotype data, um, which I didn't have time to mention in my talk, um, is, um, is looking at uh, the copy number variants. 
So basically the large insertions and deletions, uh, particularly on the sex chromosomes to confirm um, that, you know, uh, to, 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 to basically confirm any discordancy we, we see between like self-reported sex and genetic sex. To no, no actual disease classification for things that are known genetic variants of actual disease were done? Individual genetic variants, such as, you know, for Alzheimer's or things like that, no, we did not look at that. Okay, so there's no mandatory reporting if someone has, I don't know, a breast cancer No, gene there is not, anything. no. No, oh. no. All, all the analysis that we've done so far is simply um, so quality assessment. Okay, and so there's no mandatory reporting back to participants based on... No, from from what I understand, we we are not. Uh, I wouldn't say allowed, but the intention is not that, right? Okay, just an interesting uh, aside on the ethics question. Yes, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, data yeah. In yeah. General. Right. So clearly, so so this is why it was not analyzed. Yeah. Right, because okay. we 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 weren't given the mandate to analyze that, so we did not. Certainly. Uh, there is a question here from. Uh, Dr. Pache, please tell us the female-male percentage split. Uh, I do not recall. I'm sorry, but if if I recall, it's it's uh, ma mainly female, but not by a large margin, likely yeah, similar to UK Biobank. Yeah, if it's uh, oh, random uh, from the data, then it would probably yeah, be. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's slightly more female. I'm sorry, Dad. That's a very simple thing I can uh, look up, and I Certainly. did not. And we've also typed into the chat box there about where you can get further information. So the data on the 9,900 participants in the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging is available at this link. If you go to our CLSA website under researchers, um, the tab for researchers, there's a data support document that deals with uh, the genome-wide genetic data on this subset of participants. So I encourage you to uh, search our website and look at the um, data support document that's been put together on this as well. Uh, so for Laura Anderson, thanks for the nice talk. Could you describe the logistics of working with the data? Are they accessed through a remote server? And is the CLSA already participating in any networks of pooled data that need to be considered when proposing studies? Um, Vince, do you have any, sure. any thoughts yes, on, I do. on all that? So thank you for your, for your feedback. Um, so working with the data, basically the data is going to be made accessible, well, is being made accessible through through CLSA as a download. So it's not uh, analyzed on a remote server. You 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 need to download the data onto your own computer. Um, uh, using, and, and it's typically analyzed using uh, um, so fairly established software tools for genotype data, such as the ones I mentioned, um, Plink and Begenix. A lot of these tools um, work in Linux. Um, some of them work in Windows. So, for example, I know Plink works in Windows. Um, the data set at this point, um, the um, genotype data can likely be analyzed on a laptop potentially. Um, the data set's not that big, um, given the laptop has a sufficient amount of memory. Um, but the imputed data likely needs uh, some sort of a server to analyze it, like a Linux server. And what about the second part of the question? Is the CLSA participating in networks? Oh, network yes, I'm sorry about that. From what I'm aware of, um, for for the genotype data, no. So it's not How something that needs to be considered. Yeah. Okay, it doesn't need to be considered. No. So, so talking about the logistics of working with the data, one thing that occurred to me when we were when you were going through it is. Um, how how p-value thresholds were used for the quality of the data and kind of any tips or tricks for researchers that might be thinking about using it for GWASH studies? How any guidance for kind of p-value thresholds? Yeah, so usually uh, these are well-established um, so methods in genomide association studies. We simply use so Bonferroni correction for the number of independent tests. Um, the typical p-value threshold that's been used for a GWAS study that includes anywhere from 1 to 2 million SNPs um, has been 5 times 10 to the minus 8. Um, however, now that um, the imputation panels are getting more dense, so, you know, we're arriving at, you know, you know potentially 7 million or 10 million SNPs, um, I'm happy to share a paper, but we, we, we had published a paper a few years ago where we recompute um, the Bonferroni correction, and it should be 
uh, 1.2 times 10 to the minus 8. And that's what you use for the quality test thresholds as well? For, for the quality test, it's a little bit different because they were mm -hmm. um, the number of SNPs is fewer. And some of the tests, um, uh, it's it's fewer, but so I basically, it's in the QC document that's released with the um, with the genotype imputed data, but it's basically the number of tests I've done. So it's, it's the number of SNPs, 800,000 times, if I recall, the number of tests. So there were four tests. Um, and then multiplied it by the alpha threshold I used. I used a very conservative alpha threshold of 0.005. Okay, thank you. I, I don't recall what the p-value threshold was exactly for, for, for the quality assessment, but it was also very low. Okay. So when we're talking about the, the quality assessments, those four tests, kind of the, the big graph graphical um, slide that you were showing, did and then you compared it to the, the UK Biobank uh, sections. Is it is it a true statement that rarer variations would be of less quality? Did I? Is there... In general, yes, they are more difficult to impute. Um, but if you go, uh, but but I'm sorry. However, um, the vast majority of rare variants, even down to a minute little frequency of you know one percent in the population, um, are still of very good quality. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's the right. Take -home. So the threshold we usually use um, as a cutoff for discarding SNPs for low imputation is 0.3. So the info value, the y-axis on that plot, um, the line would be at 0.3 for discarding SNPs. So we'll consider t continue the conversation here a little bit uh, longer. But I encourage anybody who has any questions um, or concerns to type it into the chat box now. Uh, if anybody has any technical from any, any technical um, questions, then uh, then Vince can read it directly. So I encourage you to uh, ask your questions now. So when you um, did your uh, genetic versus self-reported sex kind of quality check, anything interesting occur from that? Yes, yes. I mean, we found it's it's in the QC document. We found. Um, 12 to 14 individuals that uh, have um, um, have basically sex-linked uh, uh, diseases. Okay. Anything and, about uh, and it corroborates with their self-reporting, right? Largely. Yeah. Where these are people that self-reported having uh, having a particularly uh, having a specific sex-linked disease, and then we basically found yeah. it using yeah. the genetic data. For any. Um kind of sex or gender studies, would there be any utility for using genetic described sex versus self self described, self reported sex and gender issues? Do you have, have you thought downstream for any of those those issues? I mean it really depends on the type of study. Um for GWASs we usually use um the genetically determined sex and not self reported. Um just because we're looking at the biology, right, and not necessarily um, you know, some you know, some sort of more environmental factor, right? Yeah, but you can see for some epidemiologic studies it might be kind of an interesting check. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, and I think maybe that kind of goes along with the 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 familial relatedness issue. So you recommended to remove the biases using subsets of populations that are homogeneous, but does that lead to any issues about? kind of minimizing genetic variants or looking kind of cross Well, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's you know? very, um, it's kind of, um, for GWAS, you know, the GWAS community tends to be exceedingly conservative when they do their analysis. And so oh, one of the ways of being conservative is to, is to try to limit um, any form of bias that you can introduce in the um, But now, you know, n n now that the algorithms are getting more advanced and people are interested in actually looking um, at the association at studies of yeah. like other mm -hmm. ethnicities, for example, um, then there are software programs and there are researchers out there that are actually specifically targeting, um, you know, yeah, those people of mixed ancestry, for an example, or other ancestries and analyzing all of the data together, right? Certainly, yeah. So yeah. it's really more 
we just basically did the analysis trying to give people something that um, they'll find useful for, for the downstream analysis. But again, it's, uh, it's their choice to use these uh, results or not, right? Certainly. At their discretion. I, 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 I see there's a question in the chat. Um, oh. Are there plans for whole genome or, or uh, sorry, whole exome or whole genome sequencing? I think there are plans for um, some whole genome sequencing, from what I understand. But I don't have any timelines on that. Okay. Well, you did a great job on kind of giving the overview and um, you know showing how how really interesting this new set of data is for people to, coming out. It, do you want to touch upon any limitations or, or cautions with using the data set? Um, no, I mean people are free to use it. Uh, you know, the only limitation is, uh, you know, is that if you don't have a lot of prior knowledge in using genetic data, um, it can be rather daunting. Um, I don't know how people, you know, if they have questions, I'm very happy to answer people's questions if they need uh, help on either the software or basically what to make sense of the data. I'm more than happy to help people. Um, I'm not sure um, what is the most efficient way to do this through CLSA. Uh, maybe go through the access portal first, right? Yeah, I think so. Just uh, ask me questions, and therefore we could keep track and you know, like build an FAQ or something for people coming. For, uh, Certainly, I think that's the plan. All right, a couple okay. more quick questions here. Are there plans to break out any nutrition-related SNPs? Uh, by breakout, meaning um, no, there are not. I mean, I, um, the question is not uh, very clear to me. If you mean like separate out SNPs and flag them, um, there is not. Um, but because we use the UK Biobank Array, you can maybe go to the um, the Affymetrics or Thermo Fisher website or to UK Biobank, and they basically describe the contents of the array. And there might already be SNPs that have been flagged as being nutrition related. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I see there's another question. In terms of phenotypic data, what is the general rate of missing information at follow up? Um, I'm sorry, I do not have that information. Um, I'm not even sure. Is, is, first follow -up, is first follow up out yet? Carol, do you know? This, this coming uh, data release will be the first call for, for follow-ups. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I'm sorry, I, I, I don't have that information on what the missing information is to follow up. So a run, we'll try to uh, maybe type type a, a answer to you as well as uh, guide you to the website when uh, follow-up two data is available to, to look at that in specific. There's also a report chapter for PHAC um, that talks about uh, future prediction of uh, missing information of follow-ups. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I greatly appreciate your time, and I enjoyed your webinar very, very much. Um, I think uh, people, as they utilize the data, will have uh, lots of questions. And as you say, we'll start trying to uh, get those questions and have them answered and maybe uh, put together a question-answer sheet for them as we work together for the future. Thank you very sure. much. Thank you. All right. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that the CLSA data access request applications are ongoing. The next deadline for applications is on February 25th. Please visit the CLSA website under data access to review available data for their information and details in the application process. I'd also like to remind everyone to complete their survey located under the polling options. If you have any questions or concerns about the poll, write it into the chat box and we can help you um, go ahead and answer this important survey to help us uh, guide future webinars. And remember that the CLS promotes this webinar series using the hashtag CLSA webinar. We invite you to follow us on Twitter. Finally, uh, next month, our monthly webinar in February is on characteristics of caregivers and care receivers in the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging by Dr. Deborah Sheets from the University of Victoria. 
So we look forward to that webinar and we invite you to go to our website and to register for our entire webinar series and for this particular webinar soon and to join us for the rest of our 2019 webinar series. Thank you again for attending today's presentation.